my topic today uh, sort of gets into a little bit of a history of sanitation, and it's something that I've been personally interested in, in uh, for a number of years, and I think more of as a hobby than a profession. I'm glad that uh, in this sort of environmental history is now a, a legitimate profession. Uh, maybe I could switch from a hobby mode uh, then. But uh, in, in, in my interest, I, I've got a bookshelf full of books, and two of the books that, that I proudly have on there, one of them is called uh, Effluent America, and the other is called The Sanitary City, both written by Martin Lewis. So I'm very honored to be in his company today, in the company of the other uh, presenters. Necessity, water quality, and what I'm going to talk about is uh, sewage pollution, uh, sewage in relationship to water quality in New York Harbor uh, over the last 400 years. So I've got to go a, uh, a year, at least I think two and a half seconds from this time of the presentation, so I'll try to do it quickly. But uh, from the harbor standpoint, there's really been three huge impacts on the system over the years. Uh, one being what we heard a little bit. Uh, Eric Sanderson, so the physical changes that were taking place uh, and, the, and the, the growing amount of water here in the early 1800s, uh, that you begin to uh, reach a peak, and then this is at the time we get some sewage treatment and then we see a reversal in the trend. Um, it wasn't until really the, the later 1800s that, that people started really being concerned about uh, the discharge of sewage from the harbor's point of view. And uh, I hope we'll hear a little bit from Dan Walsh a little bit later too, but the, the, the problems of solid waste and sewers and commerce all sort of merged at the waterfront. Uh, and you have a terrible situation that's going on on the waterfront. You've got ships that are bringing goods in and out, a lot of foodstuffs, and, you, and you're using the same location for the discharge of refuse and garbage and dead animals, a variety of other things. A nice talk for after lunch, I apologize. And, and the, um, and discharge of sewage. Most, most of uh, there was a, the, 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 the uh, network of, of underground drains uh, in the city. In the city was was fairly extensive, at least in Lower Manhattan and to some degree in Brooklyn. And a lot of the uh, outfall pipes had been extended to the pier headlines. A lot of them, uh, however, remained uh, at the bulk headlines. So you you've got this offensive conditions. Uh, that are described as, you know, in 1871, the article is extremely graphic. And to kind of give you a sense of, of both what was going on there and kind of the feeling of the time, uh, William Allen Rogers was a, a noted car, a, a cartoonist, and, and he uh, had this cartoon in Harper's 1883, which shows ships running aground from all the material that being dumped near the shoreline. You've got dead horses uh, floating around, <coughs> remnants of sewage. Uh, and these terrible weeds popping up. And he says that, that his point is New York Harbor is rapidly turning into the Everglades. And imagine it being that bad. So it kind of gives you a sense of what, what people felt even about uh, their shorelines and so forth. And, and you read the old engineering documents and they talk about wetlands that are, are these areas in dire need of reclamation. Um, also, as you get into the, the upper parts of the harbor, we were very actively used. Uh, for recreation, and the, the, uh, begin to have documents and documentation of both lots of stuff that would wash up on the beaches. So, uh, as I mentioned, when you get back into roughly 1940, we see a turnabout, which we'll get into in a moment. But uh, I, I kind of think the, the interesting period to look at is when this curve is, or this forward curve uh, uh, is, is the uh, is the sharpest slope, and that's the time roughly uh, between 1900 and 1940. So let's explore what was going on. First of all, defining the problem. How was it defined? Well, in 1903, New York State um, had a legislative commission that established something called the New York Bay Pollution Commission. Uh, and what's interesting about it is it's uh, there were interest on the part of a business group called the Merchants Association to, to move ahead with doing something because they felt that we needed to have a, a healthy harbor uh, and sort of healthy commerce. And one of the one of the things that was we'd like to talk about New York City being this wonderful place where we're, we're sort of ahead of the rest of the world. Well, in fact, um, uh, we, we were not. We, we were I think, behind a lot of other cities around the world. And it was startling to a lot of the people 
design. Well, it, what, what actually prompted uh, the legislature to take action, to take a further look at sewage pollution, was not was, was in part due to these conditions, but what really prompted them was the state of New Jersey. And this is a, a, a map that, was, that accompanied uh, this uh, report of, of this commission. And what this is, this is the Upper Bay, Newark Bay, and what uh, New Jersey, the actually, actually the Pacific Valley Sewage Authority was was uh, uh, promoting at that time was a sewer trunk line that would go under Newark Bay and, and out to um, an outlet, which today it exists here by Robins Reef, which have been out in the harbor, right next to the lighthouse. And that was because of the, the, the Pacific River was so, so contaminated with sewage. Uh, there's actually a law passed in 1907 to close down any more uh, sewage, raw sewage going into the Pacific. But this was a proposal to take sewage from the industrialized uh, portions of New Jersey and, and transport it right here just about it to the state line. So the, the New York actually went ahead and filed suit, uh, and that lawsuit went on for a long time. But the report did say that, uh, uh, that the harbor was unmistakably, but not as yet badly polluted, and it recommended the creation of a Metropolitan Sewerage Commission to, to take a further look. Uh, and this, uh, if, if you put your hands on the, the volumes that exist from, from this Metropolitan Sewerage Commission, they're just worth reading. There's hundreds and hundreds of pages and, and, and three different volumes. Um, and they were, they were asked to investigate carbon conditions uh, and investigate the most effective and feasible ways of permanently improving the purity of waters in New York. Uh, cooperate with New Jersey. Well, that, that uh, was dead on arrival when New Jersey was asked to Participate, they said, we must participate and we pursue this. Uh, so there was never really any cooperation between the states at that point. And then this commission would report back to the mayor of the city, and presumably uh, the plans that were laid out would be carried out uh, by the city. But uh, they, they actually had their offices, and uh, I'm happy to say that our offices, uh, the Hudson River Foundation, are located two flights down uh, from where they this commission had their office down in the Whitehall building, a 17 battery place. Uh, they went out to extensive investigations. They really did a fine job of characterizing the water, the sediments, uh, the flow of, the, of the, uh, the Hudson and the East Rivers, and so on. And they were led uh, by this fellow, Dr. George uh, Sober, who is kind of my hero of the story. He's a, he's a PhD sanitary engineer. Uh, who uh, was kind of a, uh, I kind of view him as, as sort of a, a Victorian um, epidemiological Sherlock Holmes in a way. He was uh, kind of a type A personality. He was a good manager. He brought this, this uh, work uh, within budget, within time. And he gained notoriety 